Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. So as many of you know, over the past few years, I have been giving a series of talks on the Satipatthana Sutta. This is the discourse the Buddha gave outlining or discussing the four foundations of mindfulness. And it's this essential, a very important discourse in the teachings because the Buddha declared it in a very unequivocal way as being the direct path to awakening. So I'll just read from the the very first paragraph of the sutta, where he says bhikkhus. And bhikkhus in the context of the teachings means anyone who is practicing for awakening. So he's really addressing us. Bhikkhus, this is the direct path for the purification of beings for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of suffering and discontent, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four Satipatthanas, or the four foundations of mindfulness. This sutta is so rich because in it, And in really just a few pages, the Buddha points out many different doors to awakening, many different doors to freedom. And as if he's saying, well, if you miss it over here, look over here. If you miss it here, there's another door and another door and another door. So it's tremendously rich in terms of our own practice. He outlines the major areas of attention or of mindfulness, namely the four foundations, which are the body, feelings, mind. And the fourth foundation is hard to translate into English. It's called mindfulness of dhammas. And dhamma in this sense or in this context means the patterns of experience, So we're looking at the body, we're looking at feelings, we're looking at the mind, and we're also being mindful of the patterns of all these things. And they include such things as the five hindrances and the five aggregates and the eightfold path, the four noble truths. And then with each of these four foundations, the Buddha then elaborates many different methods and many different techniques for practicing mindfulness. What's so interesting is that when we go through any one of these doors, it always leads to the whole. And so we can approach the practice of Satipatthana, the practice of mindfulness, from a lot of different angles, a lot of different perspectives. Last year, we ended with a discussion of the five aggregates. These are the constituent elements which comprise what we call self, what we call I. Tonight, in continuing with this series on this sutta, I want to discuss the next section, which the Buddha outlines, And he calls it mindfulness of the six internal and external sense bases. Six internal and external sense spheres. And I'll explain in more detail what all this is about. But we have a certain challenge either when we read or listen to these teachings. 
Because actually the, te- the Buddha is giving us instructions. It's not that he's just offering us, uh, offering us some philosophic analysis of how the world is or how the mind works. In all of these teachings, he's telling us what to do. He's telling us how to practice in order to free the mind. So I think it's helpful to remember as we go through both this discussion on the sense spheres and and the rest of the sutta that it's always related to our understanding of how we experience the arising of suffering and the freeing of the mind from suffering. So what are the teachings on the sense spheres? What are the six sense spheres? There's the six sense bases and their respective objects. The eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. Each one with their respective objects. Now, when I first heard these teachings, and it was uh, from my teacher, Munindraji, in Bodh Gaya, he would go on in the most laborious and repetitive way of the teachings at each of the sense doors. So we go through all the teachings at the eye and then the same teachings at the ear and then the same teachings at the nose and the tongue. And it was sometimes a little dry and repetitious. So I'm going to kind of abbreviate it somewhat. But it's also important to get into the right mindset, the right frame of mind in listening to this, because although on the surface, talking about the sense objects and sense spheres and sense bases can seem like dry philosophy, it actually is not. It's pointing to some very profound and subtle aspects of the teachings. So it's important to really listen in a way that connects it to your own experience because that's where the transformative value is. Just reflect for a moment how these six sense spheres, and by sphere I mean both the sense base and its object, how these six sense spheres constitute all we ever experience. Our whole world of experience is contained within these six spheres. The eye and visible objects, the ear and sound, the nose and smell, the tongue and taste, the body and sensations, the mind and mind objects. Do any of you experience something apart from these? The Buddha gave a discourse in which he described these six sense spheres and he he called the discourse the all. Because he was saying there are these six senses, their objects and the knowing of them and this is the totality of our experience. So right away it gets interesting. You know, we think we lead such... complex and fascinating lives, you know, involved in all kinds of activities and relationships. And yet when we bring it right down to the root of what we're experiencing moment to moment, it's always just this one of these six things. It's a sight, it's a sound, it's a smell, it's a taste, it's a touch, or it's something arising in the mind. In one way, you could think of what we call self as a six-piece chamber orchestra. And it's just these six instruments playing the music of our lives. It's very simplifying to begin to understand experience in this way. 
There was a very famous Burmese monk meditation master. His name was Lady Sayadaw. That's lady as in L-E-D-I, not L-A-D-Y. <laughs> lady Sayadaw. And he was both a great practitioner, he was a, a meditation master, as well as an unbelievable scholar of the Buddhist teachings, and his writings are so uh, rich and in-depth. He lived from the middle of the 1800s to about 1920 or 25. And he likened the six sense spheres to, to being like six train stations. And trains leave from these different stations, they lead on to either experiences of suffering, to realms of happiness, or to awakening, to freedom. And all of these trains have their origin at the station, which are the six sense spheres. And so we can see how our whole lives unfold and everything we experience as being rooted or as being based right here in the eye, in the nose, in the ear, tongue, taste, body, mind. Very fundamental. This is, this is the foundation of how our whole lives unfold. Just as a reminder, most of you are aware of this, but in the Buddhist context, the Buddha treats the mind just as a sixth sense. Right? So it's treated just like the five physical senses. And thought becomes simply the sense object of the mind. Right? And thought is seen as impersonally as all the other objects. So when we speak of the sense fears, remember that this includes the mind as well. It's considered the sixth sense. Okay, so what are the instructions that the Buddha gave in terms of contemplating these six sense fears? Because as with the rest of the sutta, he's very precise in terms of how to, how to contemplate what it is that we should actually do. So I'm reading now just from this section of the discourse. And even though it's probably a little hard to imagine, imagine that it's just the Buddha speaking to you. And okay, because I'm just giving voice to his words. Bhikkhus, that's us, in regard to dhammas, that is these patterns of experience, one abides them in terms of the six internal and external sense spheres. And how does one abide contemplating these patterns of experience in terms of the six internal and external sense spheres? Here, one knows the eye, one knows visible forms, and one knows the fetter or the defilement that arises dependent on both. Okay, so he's telling us what to pay attention to. One knows the eye, one knows visible forms, and one knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. And then he goes on in the same way with the ear, with the nose, with the tongue, with the body, with the mind. One knows each of these sense objects, the sense base, and the fetter that arises dependent on them. What's interesting about this instruction especially the first part, one knows the eye, invisible objects, ear and sound, nose, nose and smell, 
is that it seems so commonplace. Just in our every ordinary day experience, of course we know these objects. Now we've lived our entire lives knowing the different sense objects as they arise. So what is the Buddha saying here that's special or different from our ordinary way of understanding or living? There's an important and critical difference. In our usual mode of experience, experiencing the world, which is the experience of these different sense spheres, we habitually reference all experience back to a sense of self. To someone who's somewhere inside of us, the someone that is experiencing it all. You know, and so even in our language, or particularly in our language, we reinforce this way of viewing things. I see, I'm hearing, my thought. Experience all gets referenced back to a sense of self, to a sense of I. So it's not difficult to see the play of different objects as they arise in the course of a day, in the course of our lives. That's easy. What's difficult is to see all of these sense objects and the sense bases, to see and understand them as being conditioned, as being selfless, not I, not mine, not belonging to anyone. And not only seeing the sense object and sense base as selfless, but seeing the knowing of them as selfless. So I'll just give you a little example of how we can do this. When I was on on retreat here, and in reflecting on this part of the teaching... I began to explore the nature of the sense sphere of tongue and taste. And obviously I was doing this during mealtime. So the first thing I did was just focus my attention on the sense base of the tongue. That's the sense base for taste, for flavor. And just doing that was actually was a little strange. It's like this strange organ in the mouth that kind of moves around, you know, seeking the different touch sensations and going after different flavors. And when I first began looking at this carefully, it really felt like this strange organ had a mind of its own, you know, had its own agenda. It was just (laughs) kind of very actively involved in the time of eating and taking food. I mean, how often do we really sit and observe our tongues? Probably not that often. (laughs) But there's a lot to learn from it. As I watched more carefully, of course, I saw that all the movements were conditioned by an intention in the mind. It wasn't just doing its own thing independently. The mind intention was driving it all. And then I took it a step further. I was just watching the tongue with the food on it, you know, the movement and the a rising of taste, and seeing how taste consciousness, right, that is the knowing of taste, the knowing of flavor, arose from a conjunction of causes. 
It's not that there was some self there, some consciousness there waiting to receive the taste. The consciousness actually arose because of certain causes and conditions coming together. What were the causes and conditions? A tongue. Some food on the tongue. And attention. When those three come together, consciousness of taste arises. So then I played a little game. As I was eating and just watching all of this activity and this little drama in my mouth, I imagined what would happen to the knowing of taste, to consciousness, if there were no tongue. Well, it became clear that if there were no tongue, I wouldn't be knowing taste. What would happen if there was nothing on the tongue? I wouldn't be knowing taste. What would happen if there was no attention, if my mind was distracted? Also, there wouldn't be taste consciousness. So this became a very vivid experience of the con contingent nature of consciousness itself. This is very important because consciousness is often the last hideout of the self. You know, even as we can begin to see the selfless nature of so many aspects of our experience, it's very difficult to really see clearly that the knowing of it all is not I, is not mine. But when we look at the sense spheres in this very careful way, it becomes so clear that consciousness is just arising out of this conjunction of causes. Does this seem clear? I mean, you'll have to, you'll have to go and practice it. <laughs> but it's very revealing about the selfless nature of consciousness. And we can do this at each of the sense doors. Now, we could do it with the tongue, do it with the eye, with the ear, with the nose, with the body, with thoughts. When we examine our experience in this way, with this degree of care, then we become much less identified with the whole play of passing phenomena. One of the phrases that Munindraji, my first Dharma teacher, used so often, and it helped me, I, I remembered it often in, in my sittings, he would say, empty phenomena rolling on. This whole mind-body process is just empty phenomena rolling on. There's no I, there's no self, no one behind it all to whom it's happening. So all of this is summed up in one short sutta or discourse where a monk came to Ananda, who, as most of you know, was the Buddha's cousin and personal attendant, and he was there at all the teachings, so he was, he was a very wise, uh, very wise monk. And also it said he was very lovable. He had a lot of metta. So a monk came to Ananda and asked, is it possible to explain the nature of consciousness thus? For such a reason, this consciousness is not self. And so the, the, the monk is asking Ananda, is there a way to understand consciousness, to understand it as being not I, not self? The very same thing I've just been talking about. So Ananda replied, it is possible, friend. And he goes on, doesn't seeing consciousness arise independence on eyes and visible forms. Would we be seeing if we didn't have eyes? No, 
would we be seeing if there were invisible forms? No. So seeing consciousness arises dependent on these two. So the monk says, yes, friend. If the cause and conditions for the arising of seeing consciousness, that is, eyes and forms, were to cease completely, would seeing consciousness be discerned? Could we see without the causes and conditions for seeing to occur? No. So in this way, the Buddha declared, for such a reason, this consciousness is not self. This is a very uh, critical part of the teaching. Because right here is the possibility of liberation. To see that the knowing itself, awareness itself, consciousness itself, is a contingent, conditioned arising. So there was a Japanese nun who was the abbess of a monastery. And I read this little anecdote in a book called Women of the Way, discovering 2,500 years of Buddhist wisdom. It's all about the wisdom of the Buddha as experienced and taught by women over these 2,500 years. So this is about a nun named Tejitsu. She was the abbess of of a nunnery. It said that she saw that a rising phenomena arose, abided, and fell away. She saw that the knowing of this arose, abided, and fell away. Then she knew There was nothing more than this. She saw the arising phenomena, arising, abiding, passing away. She saw the knowing of this, arising, abiding, and passing away. Then she knew there was nothing more than this. No ground, nothing to lean on, stronger than the cane she held nothing to lean upon at all, and no one leaning. And she opened the clenched fist in her mind and let go and fell into the midst of everything. I thought that was just such a beautiful expression of the understanding that leads to freedom. And that's what the Buddha is talking about in this section of the Satipatthana Sutta. Knowing the arising phenomena arise, abide, and pass away so that the knowing of it arose, abode, and fell away and that there was nothing more than this. No ground, nothing to lean upon at all and no one leaning. And she opened the clenched fist in her mind and let go and fell into the midst of everything. Okay, let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) So the question, perhaps, that's arising in the mind is what keeps us from opening the clenched fist of our minds and falling into the midst of everything. Now, why don't we simply let go in this way? So the Buddha explains why in the next part of the teaching, the next part of the instruction. Because he says to know not only the sense base and its object, 
and the knowing of them, but also to know the fetter or the defilement. <clears throat> In Pali, the word is kalesa, but also to know the fetter or defilement that arises dependent on them. And it's that fetter or defilement, a kalesa, that's what keeps us from opening the clenched fist of our mind. So this is what we have to know. This is what we have to recognize. This is what we have to become mindful of. In our practice, we can watch for the arising of the fetter at any of the six sense doors. And this is not an academic exercise. Again, the Buddha is not talking philosophy here. He's talking about the nature and the cause of suffering and the nature and the possibility of freedom. So this has a profound impact on how we live. This is made very clear and very vivid in the third sermon the Buddha gave after his enlightenment. Now he was enlightened under the tree, the, now called the Bodhi tree, in Bodh Gaya. And after his enlightenment, he spent some time in the vicinity of the tree, contemplating different aspects of what he had just realized, and then went, traveled, wandered all through northern India, teaching various individuals and groups of people. And soon after his enlightenment, you know, many, many of the Indian ascetics were drawn to him by the power of his awakening and became monks. So in this sermon his third sermon, he was addressing a thousand monks who had been fire-worshipping ascetics, you know, which is one of the kind of ascetic practices that, that people in India did at that time, that ascetics did. And so the Buddha used their own experience as the metaphor for his teaching. So this sutta is called the fire sermon, right, because they had been worshipping fire. So this is what the Buddha says. Bhikkhus, all is burning. And what bhikkhus is the all that is burning? The eye is burning. Visible forms are burning. Eye consciousness is burning. Eye contact is burning. And whatever feeling arises with eye contact, whether pleasant or painful or neutral, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, with the fire of hatred, with the fire of delusion. Burning with birth, aging, and death with sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and despair. And then he goes on, the ear is burning, the nose is burning, the tongue, which I won't repeat in all its detail. But then he says, seeing thus, the instructed noble disciples become disenchanted with the eye, with forms, with eye consciousness, with eye contact, with whatever feeling arises with eye contact, whether pleasant, painful, or neutral, becomes disenchanted with the ear, with the nose, tongue, body, mind. Becoming disenchanted, one becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, one's mind is liberated. All right, there is an interesting use of language. I very much appreciate the phrase, the, the word disenchanted, because sometimes we interpret it in a somewhat negative way. We're disenchanted with something and we're kind of sorry about it. But if you consider the meaning of the word, it means coming out of enchantment. Right? We were no longer lost or caught by the spell of enchantment. 
Right? And through that, we actually free the mind. Well, most of us probably have not been worshipping fire very much, in, at least in this life. So I think it's useful to see what our own metaphor might be, to really look very directly at our experience when the mind is conditioned by greed and desire, when it's colored by hatred or anger, you know, or lost in delusion. Maybe we're not experiencing it as a burning, not having been fire-worshipping ascetics. But how do we feel it? What is, what is the energetic sense when the fetters of desire, of craving, of anger, of hatred, of delusion are present? It would be very helpful to look carefully at this you know, so that we begin to feel in a very experiential way what the suffering of these defilements is about. Because the more clearly we can recognize it on the energetic level, oh yeah, this is the contraction, this is the stress, this is the unease of the mind when it's filled with desire or hatred or delusion. Right, so we really recognize it very clearly and very directly for ourselves. In doing that, it becomes much easier then to recognize these fetters or defilements when they arise and to be able to let them go. If you became aware of the burning in holding a hot coal, would you need much prompting to drop it? Probably not, right? Because we would feel the suffering of it and the letting go would be the most natural response. The problem is because we haven't practiced paying careful attention to the six sense fears and to what arises, the fetters that arise, dependent on them, we often are not aware that we're holding a hot burning coal. You know, when with the eye or the ear or the nose or the tongue or the body or the mind, we are caught by desire or caught by irritation or anger or delusion. We often miss, we're not paying attention to the fact this is, this is a state of suffering. And because we're not seeing clearly, we keep holding on. Not, uh, what was the phrase? Not opening the clenched fist in the mind, falling into the midst of everything. Right? We hold on. Okay, so how can we bring this into our practice? We can do it in the sitting. And just this is just one example, but there will be many, many examples at any of the sense doors. So for example, you're sitting and you're being with the breath. So you feel the tactile sensations of the air passing the nostrils, so the, the sensations of the movement of the chest or abdomen. Okay, so the body is the sense base, the sensations are the sense object, there's the knowing of them. Just in being with the breath, or perhaps other physical sensations, do you notice any resistance? Is there any pushing away in the mind? or not wanting to open? Do you notice any wanting in the mind? Sometimes the calaces or the defilements are very obvious, but sometimes they're very subtle. You know, there can just be a slight 
leaning into something or a slight holding back from something or a slight pushing away. But as our mindfulness gets more refined, we begin to see even these subtle levels of defilements. One of the ways I experience it a lot is I often notice in my mind just this inclination to help things along. You know, and there's, there's a very apt Taoist phrase that says, don't push the river. But we push the river a lot. You know, the river of our experience the breath and everything we experience at the six sense doors, it's all flowing along fine by itself. But we're often leaning into trying to make better, trying to fix it in some way. There's a world of difference. There's... there's That doesn't even express how different. There's, there's a universe of difference between the mind that wants, the mind that's leaning into experience, and a true openness without preference. Right there is our involvement or our entanglement, our enchantment with suffering and freedom. That's how big the difference is. The difference between a mind that's wanting anything and the mind that's truly open without preference. So this is a very critical uh, understanding uh, to explore. The third Chan Zen ancestor in China wrote this wonderful, quite short, you could call it a sutta or a discourse. It's called On the Faith Mind or On the Trusting Mind. And you'll recognize, I think, the first few lines of it, but he captures the importance of this distinction of the mind wanting and not wanting. He says, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When like and dislike are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. Those few lines are everything we need. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. What do we have preferences about? We have preferences about the six sense objects. Because that's the all. That's the totality of our experience. And so we can practice this very profound teaching. Right here in the very mundane aspects of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. We can be watching very carefully. Does the mind have preference? Is it making distinction? Does it want this rather than that? Or can it settle back, relax back into that space of complete openness? This is not to say that we stop making choices in our lives. Because in order to live our lives, we are 
very often making different choices. But rather, at the sixth sense doors, especially in the context of a retreat, we can practice, even if it's just for a few moments at a time, practice the mind of non-craving, of not wanting, of not clinging just sitting back, and sometimes I'll, I'll use that phrase in my mind as a reminder. I'll just kind of have that phrase come, mind of no craving. And just with that reminder, you know, I can feel, even if it's just for a few moments, that dropping back into openness, into non-doing. Ajahn Jamnian is one of the great Thai meditation masters who's who's still living. And he actually visited here uh, a little while ago. And he has a very expansive, creative mind. And so he wrote something just to this point. He said, at some point the mind becomes so clear and balanced that whatever arises is seen and left untouched with no interference. One ceases to focus on any particular content and all is seen as simply mind and matter, an empty process arising and passing away of its own. A perfect balance of mind with no reaction there is no longer any doing. And so, we're really practicing non-doing. No preference. Not wanting. At each of the sense doors, with whatever sense object is arising. In addition to noticing this in the sitting, you can really be practicing this throughout the whole day. Notice the different sense spheres and the fetters that arise dependent on them. You know, as they become predominant at different times in the day. So at times maybe it will be around disturbing sounds. You know, so either in the hall or or outside, there's some sound that's disturbing or enticing. You know, it could be on either side where an enchanting sound. Sense base, sense object, consciousness arising, and the fetter that's dependent on it. It could be the aroma of the food as you're going through the food line. You know, you've been practicing all morning and lunch is the big hit and you're going through the food line and there's eggplant parmesan and it just smells so good. Sense space of no sense object, smell, the knowing of it and the fetter that arises. Is there wanting, is there craving or not? You know, are we, are we remaining with that mind of no preference, that mind of openness? It might be sights, just different sights that stimulate either desire or aversion. Might be thoughts or fantasies. Might be mind objects in which you can observe this. One of the things that I love so much about the Buddhist teachings is that he's so direct. You know, he doesn't... He doesn't soften the edges to make us feel good. He just... He just says it like it is. So I want to read... (laughs) One of those statements. Forms 
sounds, tastes, odors, tactile sensations, and all mental objects. This is the terrible bait of the world with which the world is infatuated. But when one has transcended this, the mindful disciple of the Buddha shines radiantly like the sun, having transcended Mara's realm. I love that expression, the terrible bait of the world. <laughs> because I get the image of kind of all these sense objects. You know, and there are only six of them. <laughs> but the, the, the parade of these six different sense objects... I get this image of them coming by like on little hooks and I often feel myself like a fish. Just <laughs> you know, Okay, this one's coming by, <laughs> biting on that one, biting on that one, biting on that one. And then when there's some wisdom in the mind, actually not biting. You know, and then there's simply the experience of each of them just as they are. There's no problem. Transcending Mara's realm shining radiantly like the sun. That is the mind without preference, without like and dislike, in just that place of openness. The Buddha gave such importance to these teachings on the six sense spheres and being mindful of them. Because this is the place, it's the exact place where we either get caught by desire and aversion or we remain free. So this is, this is a very critical part of our understanding of the practice. So tonight talked about the sense fears and knowing the fetters that arise dependent on them. Next week, continue with this same section of the sutta on the sense fears. But next week we'll discuss how the fetters arise. What's the process by which we get caught? You know, and, and the Buddha's brilliance is his such clear understanding of the process of the mind, of how it is that we get caught in the arising of the fetters and how we can be free. This place of openness is described in remaining in this place or abiding in it described in a few lines uh, by the poet Adrian Rich. And I just came across them and they're just, they're just so captured. What we're doing here. She wrote, If the mind were clear, and if the mind were simple, you could take this mind, this particular state, and say, this is how I would live if I could choose. This is what is possible. If the mind were clear and if the mind were simple, you could take this mind, this particular state, and say, this is how I would live if I could choose. This is what is possible. 